Thank you, David, and thank you for this occasion to spend a day with you and this very exciting topic. Um, my job in CNES is something singular, quite unique. I'm in charge of ethics, space ethics. Uh, probably the first time the history of space agencies as one space agency decided to create uh, this mission and I, uh, I was lucky enough to, to take this mission 10 years ago now. So I am only a, a generalist, uh, not a specialist in astrobiology or specialist in, spe or in launcher or specialist in planetary protection, but I have to, to be uh, ready to, to go in, in all these directions uh, day after day sometimes. Um, for me, uh, astrobiology is a real new challenge for ethics. Uh, ethics not only in, uh, in, in space, but uh, ethics in general. And uh, so it's a, a real invitation to, to follow uh, the work uh, led by uh, David and uh, for a long time now, and I hope in the future. If we need one um, uh, illustration of the uh, ethical dimension uh, of uh, astrobiology. We can only uh, uh, watch the, uh, the real success of the Rosetta mission, especially the, the landing of, of uh, Philae three months ago. And uh, we know that it was a, a huge event even before, and uh, all the uh, European uh, space agencies were ready to, to engage their uh, all their means in, in media to, to inform people about that. Uh, but at least when the day arrived, the success was incredible. Uh, in CNES was probably the, the main event in our uh, uh, activity for now a very long time. Every, uh, every level uh, crash, uh, the result was in, in, incredibly huge. Uh, we know the reason of that. It was a real technical adventure, uh, technical success, human engagement and, and some uh, uh, bound and rebound and okay, everything was uh, uh, here to, to give this success. But at the same time, what I can uh, hear and, and learn was the, the interest of the public to the question of the origin of, of Earth, of uh, water on Earth and perhaps origin of life. And all these questions are always uh, a real interest, at the same time some, some fear. Uh, what means for us to be more, to have more information con concerning our own origin? That's the reason for me that astrobiology is a very uh, new and real challenge for uh, the uh, ethical uh, interrogation. Um, in my mind, ethics never means uh, what or, or only means uh, what is possible to do and what is forbidden to do. It's only the result of the uh, ethical process. First, we have to, to ask ourselves why we are doing something, what's the reason to engage in a specific program, uh, which we, what sort of means, uh, what are the consequences, and at least we can perhaps decide to go or not to go. We, we can decide to to authorize or to forbid something is only the, the result. Um, you see my talk is very uh, simple, it's only slide, mm -hmm. okay. Uh, I'm more historian than scientist with a lot of picture. Um, we are in Portugal and uh, you know as me uh, the importance of this country in the discovery of the, of the globe. It began for a long time now. Uh, you know the name of uh, Henry the Navigator from Porto, or the name of uh, Vasco de Gama, or the name of uh, um, Fernando de Magellanes. Uh, and after the name, but it's coming from Spain, uh, Christopher Columbus. Um, but in my story, or the little story I try to, to give you this, this afternoon, um, the year of 1492 is not the year of the discovery of the new world. It's the year of a very important event in France, uh, the actual France, in Alsace. Perhaps you know that in uh, November 1492, 
a thunderstorm arrive, crash very near a little town in Alsace. It's the northeast of France now. And uh, Anzissan is the name of this little town. And the reason that the event is very important for our story, I mean, even in astrobiology, is that it was the first uh, even known and listed as a, a rival of a meteorite, a thunderstorm on Earth. We have some proof of the, this sort of even before, even in the, in the written story, but the stone was here on the ground. And the first uh, man who saw this, this even, the young boy, uh, take a little piece of this stone as an amulet. And it's okay. The, the, what became after this stone is another story. But uh, at this occasion, people have to recognize that. Uh, the sky is not perfect. The sky is imperfect, and you can receive a piece of the sky on your head. And that's a, a, the first example of the movement between dualistic cosmology to what uh, I mean, dualistic cosmology to diversify universe. You know, perhaps, or you have to know, that um, until the modern time, until the 17th century, uh, in Occident, the main cosmology was dual, dualistic cosmology. Cosmos means the beautiful and ordained totality. It's a way that the Greek described the sky. The sky was the globality of the reality. And this sky was perfect, was eternal, uh, was complete and totally ordained with the movement of the stars, the movement of the planets, sometimes on the crystal spheres. And if you can find beings in the cosmos, it's only, they are also perfect, eternal. They are God or angels. And it's above you. But on the Earth is the contrary. Is a, Earth was a place of the material, imperfection, what is always changing, transformed. And the being on Earth, after they are born, they are growing, they are trying to reproduce themselves, and at least dying. Nothing to do with the cosmos, a real frontier between Earth, sublunar dimension, and sky. Cosmos, supralunar dimension. And it was totally impossible for being, and especially human being, to dream to go in the cosmos. I mean, with their own material, imperfect body. Perhaps they can dream to, have a, to make a spiritual travel. Uh, perhaps after the death, if they are good enough to be accepted by the, the God, but nothing more. It was a real and con concrete frontier between Earth and cosmos. And that's the reason that the event in Enzyme, at just at the, at the end of the 15th century, is so important in the story, because it was a, quite the first proof that perhaps cosmos was not so perfect. And perhaps we have to change this cosmology to another way to represent the reality. You know, as me, that this event in Enzyme was not uh, strong enough to uh, change all this, the way to represent the reality and, and to represent the sky and, and in fact, to to abandon the idea of cosmos. Um, we need to wait one century more and, arri and to arrive at the beginning of the 17th century, the work of, not so Copernic, but the work of, of Galileo and the first observation of the, of the, the moon and then the Jupiter moons and all, all what you know probably uh, as me. And at this time, it was really a passage to uh, this dualistic cosmos, to the, uh, to the universe, the idea of 
universe, unique, is the same. No more frontier between Earth and sky. No more uh, sublunar and supralunar as a difference without the possibility to, to cross this border, this frontier. And uh, when I discovered the, the later, the, the, the answer of, of Kepler to Galileo, uh, after the, uh, the publication by Galileo of the first results. It's really the first time that we have the sort of uh, conception of the, of the space travel because Kepler say, okay, if, if it's the same matter on Earth and in the sky, one time in the future, people have the possibility to travel in the sky. No more uh, a strong frontier between us and the sky. We know that it takes more than a few days. It would take quite three centuries and more to, to realize this dream of Kepler. But now, uh, with, with Galileo, with Kepler, and after this event in Ensign, it was possible to dream, to dream, to travel in this uh, new uh, reality. Um, by the same uh, way, the uh, verticality was before a uh, hierarchy. Above was nothing, and uh, I'm sorry, under was nothing, and above was perfect. And, and now, after this revolution, this first scientific revolution of the modern time, you can say that verticality is only a possibility to diversification, diversity. No more hierarchy, it's something another something very, very different. And by the same way, what before was given as characteristic to God was now given to the universe. You know that before God, one of the many multiple definitions of God was uh, a reality whose center is everywhere and circumference nowhere. And now, universe is this reality where the center is everywhere and circumference nowhere. And uh, it's a real, real uh, modification and evolution in, the, in the, uh, the world of ideas. And at this occasion, uh, the imagination of people can be engaged in the direction of sky, of the old cosmos, even though we can use always cosmos, but it, you know, it's not just with the same difference between uh, Earth and, and, and sky. I mean, with the characteristic that I, that, that, I, that I give just before. Imagination is not uh, born with the 17th century. It's a very old characteristic of human mind, and one of the most uh, important, pr probably. Um, we know that with the emergence of humankind, uh, human being has the possibility to, to imagine something uh, outside their own horizon. What is above, uh, in the other side of, the, of my little horizon? Our horizon is very, very narrow, something like five kilometers, and after it's the horizon. And I suppose that the first human being tried to know what is beyond my horizon. Uh, is it possible to find other people as me? Is it possible to find other society as my society? And perhaps just behind the mountain, behind the sea, behind the, the river. And after the 17th century, it was possible to say, and, and perhaps uh, behind the sky. Just. Before it was okay, it was the, the, the country, the land of the God, angel, something totally different as me. But now, after this uh, astronomical revolution, what arrived? Perhaps we can find some beings quite similar as me. I can imagine that. Or perhaps not totally similar, but something different, but the possibility to perhaps to communicate with these with this people. And if you, you read the literature, you see that before the 17th century, you have a lot of examples of this sort of imagination of other world, 
but only on Earth. It's very few examples of other world in the sky. Very few examples. Other world on Earth, yes, you find that. Remember the very famous book of Thomas More, Utopia. Utopia seems nowhere. And it's in the context of the great discoveries coming from Portugal, for example. Uh, More, Thomas More, imagine an island, nowhere, Utopia. But it's a satiric work. And the people are, are the same as us, but it was a, a, a way to critique his own society. You can find, just at the same time, uh, with the work of Galileo, uh, just at the beginning of 17th century, uh, a man as Joseph Hall published a book, uh, and the name is uh, Mundus Alter, Other World. But again, it's other world on this earth, because at this time it was impossible again to imagine something in the sky. But just after, the, or during this astronomical revolution, you find the first publication where the other world are in the sky. Francis Godwin published in 1638, the, moon, the man on the moon. Now, the humankind can fly in the sky, can reach the moon, and, and, and beyond the moon. You know, Cyrano de Bergerac was just after 1657, Histoire comique des États et empire de la Lune. And, and, and it's only the beginning. A number, a huge number of this sort of uh, creation, publication with the imagination, what is beyond the, or the space horizon, on the moon and beyond the moon. And for us, you can find people as us or similar to us. Sure that uh, in this context, with this uh, possibility of plurality of world due to the imagination, uh, with this freedom of imagination, the second revolution, the second scientific revolution due to Charles Darwin has a, a very strange effect because Charles Darwin, if I could understand, but after that you have a, another speaker with more knowledge as me, uh, Charles Darwin introduced something uh, different because if I, go, if I understand, it's, yes, the, the fact that life is not so, um, is, a, is a result of um, emergence and, uh, and hazard and, and it's not so easy to obtain life. And it's a sort of paradoxical situation from Coming from the first revolution, astronomical revolution, you can say, okay, Earth is a very common, seems to be very common in this huge and infinite universe. Uh, yes, uh, very common. And in this other way, due to Charles Darwin, we can say, oh no, but life, it seems to be quite unique. It's not so easy to obtain life, perhaps. So we have now to, to manage that. Um, and after it, this time, you can find sometime example of people saying, no problem, you can find life everywhere in the universe. And you know, I probably asked me this very interesting uh, prize, uh, Guzman Prize, uh, pro proposed by the uh, Academy of Science of France. Uh, the Guzman Prize uh, offer um, a huge um, amount of money to the person of whatever nation who will find the means within the next 10 years, it was uh, proposed in, just in, um, in uh, 1900, uh, within the ten, next 10 years of communicating with a star and of receiving an, a, a, an answer. And you know that Mars was outside this prize because it was very clear to these people that Mars have inhabitants and it will be very easy in the 10 years to have communication with them. So it's the, uh, uh, this um, very, um, this evolution in the history of ID uh, between this uh, dualistic cosmology and the 
uh, this diversified universe. What I, I think, again, with my um, ethical um, interest, we have probably now to, to have some reflection concerning the idea of loneliness. Because until now, okay, we find exoplanets, we find a lot of, we have a lot of results concerning the origin of life, the possibility of emergence of, of life on, on other planets, okay, and I, I err, and uh, what, we, what you explained during this day and, and during the following days, but until now, we are alone. We have no proof of something that another form of life is now existing everywhere in the universe. And probably we have to, to try to evaluate what, what means for us as human beings to be alone and to have this uh, sensation of loneliness. Because during all this long time of discovery of our planet, of the other society around this glo the globe during the, the discovery, discovery, and, and but now we make the, the two. You, we know quite every, everywhere on the, on the Earth, we are no more unknown uh, uh, countries, no more terra incognita, and okay, and we are alone. And how to manage that? And I think that in the future we have to uh, probably to try to elaborate a sort of uh, treaty of loneliness for a uh, human being in the 21st century. Um, th this idea of loneliness is very interesting. In fact, uh, we can say that uh, um, loneliness is not a normal condition of living. I find a very interesting uh, quotation from a, a French writer, uh, in the middle of the 19th century, and he, he said, oh, in fact, uh, we are never alone. We are, uh, each of us uh, is, is a, a sort of a little planet with our own inhabitants. And that's, that's correct, even if it's in the 19th century, and we know now we are really full of inhabitants. <laughs> and these inhabitants are probably also little planets with also inhabitants. So it's, in fact, uh, loneliness doesn't exist at the uh, biological level. But when we mean uh, loneliness is when we have no, uh, um, or can say that, no um, uh, fellow in our neighborhood, when we don't have alter ego in our neighborhood. And we know that loneliness could be uh, accepted could be chosen, perhaps, uh, for refuge, for uh, fear of promiscuity, fear of other, but it's all, always only a temporary situation, temporary condition. And uh, it's very dangerous if it's an, an end in itself. Um, we can perhaps, it's only a few um, ideas for, for our uh, future treaty of loneliness. Uh, for the 21st century, but um, we can also try to manage the uh, difference between nomadism and uh, sedentarism. Uh, it's not the same manner, man, manner to be alone when you are a nomad and when you are a sedentary. Uh, if you are alone, but uh, as a nomad, you can, okay, you can change, you can take your your car again, or your horse, or your camel, I see your camel this morning, and okay, and you, you pursue your travel, and you, perhaps you find uh, uh, people on your way, and it's a good, it's quite easy to, to go outside your own loneliness. If you are sedentary, as us today on Earth, we are on our own planet, and without, or only very, very lot, uh, Without, uh, you, uh, sorry, with, without easy way to, to be again nomad, uh, it's something different. It's not so easy to, uh, to break our loneliness. We have perhaps three ways to break loneliness. Uh, first is communication. Communication. Communication is again a very uh, normal uh, way to be 
it belongs again to our uh, condition of, of being, or life being. Uh, communication is a way to disseminate our, what, we, what we are, what we have, perhaps. At the same time, we know that it's not so easy to, to communicate. And uh, if you, uh, we know that, for example, in this, uh, even I've known that this, it doesn't belong to cost, but uh, the difficulty to elaborate the message of Pioneer and Voyager probes, what not so easy to, to communicate to possible extraterrestrial intelligence. Or now, when you learn or you teach that uh, Stephen Hawking refused to elaborate message because it's too dangerous. So, communication. The second solution is to wait. Wait is also a very clear biological attitude. And uh, we are always waiting on something. And it's uh, in connection with imagination. And uh, at least uh, we can uh, try to become again nomad. And OK, using ves space vessel, using probes, and, and trying to, to go to the, uh, to the meeting of other, uh, of other with where are and who are they. It's a question, but to take to, to go outside to break our um, loneliness. And only some suggestion concerning this topic, but I think that it could be very interesting for our reflection and our ethical reflection. At least some question for sapiens, sapiens is for us. Um, the first question was very clear today is what is life? It's a very, very important today, importance today to trying to, to give some answer, never definitive answer. Uh, and even if I always remember this sentence from uh, Francois Jacob, the French biologist, explaining that we don't uh, interrogate life today in our lab. Please try to interrogate again life in your lab, in your telescope, in your probe, and not only little part of living beings. It's a real challenging question. It's, it's important from the philosophical point of view, for the scientific po point of view, for the epistemological point of view, but even for people around us. It's a very c common and difficult ethical question today. What is life? And, uh, even if I, ref I refuse, I avoid to, to enter in the debate, but uh, what is love at the beginning? What is love at the end? That's the reason what you are doing as in astrobiology biology is not only theoretical. It's a, it's a way to influence our, your society today. Take care with that. Uh, when you are trying to to discover all other uh, form of life. Uh, the question after that is what sort of relation, what sort of connection we are or between, uh, we, we can establish between us and this other form of life. Is this another uh, similar form of life? Is it alter ego or not? And the last question, uh, when you mention the question of habitability, even if uh, uh, Jean-Pierre Bigbring refused his idea, uh, uh, it's, we know that today it's a very huge challenge for our humankind. Not habitability of Mars and, and uh, some icy planet, or, uh, but from our Earth. Never forget that. What you are today introducing as uh, element, what means habitability first, as immediately, uh, social and, and political uh, consequence. My uh, message to home, I find this uh, home message this morning, uh, is a very interesting sentence coming from uh, South Africa. And I think that it's a, a good way to uh, influence your own research. Uh, I am, perhaps we are, 
as old as our most cruel disappointments and as young as our boldest dream. Thank you.